All right, well, we are at the hour. Um, so welcome everybody to Medical Grand Rounds, uh, another very special Medical Grand Rounds with our uh, graduating or outgoing chief resident, Dr. Catherine Fell. So Dr. Fell is the Vogelman Carnes Endowed Chief Resident. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Loyola University in Chicago with a bachelor's degree in biology. She then uh, continued at Loyola for um, medical school and uh, was honored as um, being elected to AOA. Then headed north to do a residency here. Um, and throughout her training, she's been actively engaged in the education mission. She completed the teach pathway during residency and was a lead in the resident as educator curriculum and was selected to participate in the Harvard Macy program for postgraduate trainees. Um, she's been involved and interested in simulation dating back to her internship when she received a Department of Medicine Medical Innovation, uh, Medical Education Innovation Grant to create a point of care ultrasound curriculum for the residency. The curriculum has expanded over the past three years under her leadership and um, now includes an introductory course and an elective rotation uh, at the VA and has trained to date over 85 residents, which is impressive starting from uh, your intern year. So kudos for that. She's presented her work on simulation at national conferences and has received national recognition for her curriculum innovations. Um, and um, importantly, she's mentored uh, the next generation of residents to lead the curriculum. So important to ensure uh, the sustainability of the program that she's built and that her legacy continues on. In recognition of her skills as an educator, Dr. Fell was awarded the Resident Excellence in Teaching Award when she finished her residency. Um, we are very excited for her next plans. Dr. Fell is continuing her journey um, with a cardiology fellowship at University of Michigan um, with career goals of pursuing a, a pathway in as a clinician educator. And I know that she's going to be a leader in the field and I am looking forward to following her career and um, very excited for her. So with that, she, I. I present Dr. Fells to talk about, it's not quite like riding a bike, role of simulation in medicine resident education. Dr. Fell. Thank you so much, Dr. Schnapp, for that really kind introduction. Like Victoria said, it is always nice to have someone else read your CV and hear it said back to you. I have no relevant financial disclosures. This spring, I started thinking a lot about traveling again. As COVID restrictions were starting to lighten, I thought about trips to see my family and friends. As I was perusing the New York Times travel section, I came across an article. In 2020, COVID led to the largest decline in global air passenger travel in aviation history. Thousands of pilots were either laid off or placed on an extended furlough for up to 12 months. Now, as vaccination programs are picking up speed across parts of the world and the travel industry is starting to rebound, airlines are bringing back these pilots to fill the gaps. Surprising and truthfully kind of scary, returning pilots are making mistakes and accidents are occurring. Now, when the aviation reporting system has looked into these errors, they find that pilots are frequently blaming the same thing the pandemic. It turns out to safely fly a plane, the devil's in the details. Getting behind the wheel to fly again, it's not quite like riding a bike. Small skills which pilots previously took for granted as intuitive really only remain sharp with constant flying. Once flying stops, these skills unknowingly slip away. Now, the point of my grand rounds is not to instill fear into each of you into not flying this summer. You are not supposed to jump off this Zoom call right now and call United and have them cancel your flight and give you a refund. In fact, you should feel really comfortable to go on your flight this summer. The aviation industry sees this, these errors as problematic 
and have already quickly gone about implementing changes to prevent them from occurring further. Airlines are now forcing returning pilots to go through rigorous skills assessment, like classes, exams, and simulations before they can return to flying. Hearing the aviation industry's response to these errors and the quick implementation of intensive training and simulation to fill the gaps left me thinking about how medicine responds to these scenarios. In medicine, like aviation, we too deal with high stakes situations during which lives are at risk. Several times a week in our hospital, a code blue indicating a cardiac arrest is called on a patient. A rush of people will descend on the room of this dying patient. What if I told you half of the people responding to this code to serve as the code leader did not feel comfortable in this role. On top of this, it might be months, maybe even a year since they last had to lead a code. Actually, this might be their first code. Unlike aviation, we expect our trainees to take over these types of high risk events after periods of time off or minimal training. Another example of this, and perhaps one of the biggest transitions, is July 1st at all academic hospitals. We all know the old adage, see one, do one, teach one in medicine. But I can tell you, watching my senior resident land a 747 plane in medical school was much different than me actually sitting in the pilot seat myself. So what can we in medicine learn from aviation on how to better prepare our residents for the demands of clinical practice? Particularly, how can we help build our trainees' confidence and skill in a safe environment so when they are faced with their miracle on the Hudson event at work, they are prepared? This, this is where simulation can help. By the end of my presentation, you will recognize that a cardiac arrest is a high stakes, complex situation requiring multiple skills that clinical training alone is not preparing our residents to handle. You'll be able to describe the multiple components of a simulation curriculum and explain why deliberate practice and mastery-based learning are educational tools best suited to help our residents be experts leading a cardiac arrest. And finally, you will be able to identify barriers to the implementation of a mastery-based simulation curriculum and identify future areas for development within our own residency simulation program. My talk will be divided into five parts. First, we'll go through an introduction to the experience of being a code leader and review central components of a simulation curriculum. We will then discuss two educational concepts which can help build expertise, those being deliberate practice and mastery-based learning. Following this, we'll review studies demonstrating the effectiveness of these concepts in leading ACLS skills training. And finally, we'll consider the barriers to creating this type of curriculum and possible future areas for growth within our own residency program. So what are the expectations for our residents leading a cardiac arrest? To break these down, let's have you envision yourself approaching one of these events. Let's have you be placed at the start of a second year of residency, another big transition in internal medicine training. For some of you, this may be a promotion, others, it may be a demotion. But either way, imagine yourself having just come back from your intern last that week at the end of intern year. You're starting as the new senior resident on VA general medicine wards with a brand new intern. You've been pretty nervous for this day. You trust you have the knowledge to take care of the patients, but you're worried about assuming the role of team leader and that loss of senior resident support. Either way, you muster all the confidence you can 
and hope to just get through day one. Just as you and your intern are about to start pre-rounding, your pager goes off and you hear this overhead. Sadly, it's not a BERT alert and they're calling a code on one of your patients. You and your intern start heading towards the patient's room. As you approach the room, you see a crowd of people spilling out into the hallway. You press your way through the room, place yourself at the foot of the bed and prepare yourself to lead this team. Now, the House of God really excellently captured the stress of being a code leader as a resident. A cardiac arrest by definition is a high pressure, infrequent situation with a life or death outcome that often occurs in a room overflowing with people. Your ability to serve as the commander in chief in this situation depends not only on your ability to take your own pulse and calm yourself, but also on understanding both the leadership roles and multiple other components of a code. So let's break this down a little bit and see how this is gonna play out. First, position yourself at the foot of the bed Clear your throat and without your voice cracking, declare that you, Dr. X, are leading this team. As they roll the patient to place a backboard under them, you notice the patient only has a 22 gauge IV in the right wrist. It appears bent and nurses say it's not flushing. Assign another nurse to get IO access. The nurse performing chest compressions seems to be tiring out. Assign someone to take over. At the two minute pulse check, the monitor reads sinus rhythm and nurses tell you they can't feel a pulse. You realize this is a PEA arrest. You prompt the team to resume chest compressions and ask for epinephrine. Now that you know this is a PEA arrest, you out loud try to run the list of causes. Could it be hemorrhage, tamponade? You crowdsource, asking the team what they think could be going on. The patient's nurse mentions they were feeling short of breath before the arrest happened. Could this be a PE? This, it's a lot for any physician to keep track of, but it is especially hard for a young trainee who is still forming their clinical identity. Knowing the ACLS algorithm is just one component of this really complex role. Given this, it's easy to understand why 75% of internal medicine residents feel inadequately trained to lead ACLS teams, approaching these situations feeling underprepared, undersupervised, and anxious about committing error. It's not enough to just have the ACLS algorithm memorized. You also need leadership, interpersonal skills, and communication skills all in addition to an ability to work in a high stakes, stressful environment when everyone is looking at you. And it's not just that residents don't feel prepared to lead these codes, they also perform poorly as team leaders. Data collected from one institution showed that the quality of cardiac resuscitation led by ACLS trained providers varied widely and that it didn't always meet published standards. Chest compressions were often too fast and too shallow. Providers were often hyperventilating patients and allowed too much time off the chest. Aware of these problems, the American Heart Association modified the resuscitation guidelines in an attempt to improve provider confidence in leading codes and clinical outcomes for in-hospital cardiac arrests. Three areas were particularly highlighted in the education section as things to incorporate into future training programs. The AHA recommended increasing leadership and teamwork training with a focus on simulation-based education. They also recommended structuring ACLS training around two educational learning theories, those being deliberate practice and mastery-based learning. So is the AHA telling us that we should learn cardiac arrest teams by Google glasses and virtual reality goggles? What do they mean by simulation? In simple terms, simulation is the imitation or representation of one act or system by another. In medical education, 
Simulation takes learners through lifelike experiences in a controlled environment designed to mimic real clinical encounters. When conducted well, simulation is an ideal educational environment. It encourages learning through experimentation, allowing a trainee to stop, rehearse, and rewind, all without a negative patient outcome. It's also really great if you're an educator it allows you an opportunity to provide feedback and also assess your learner's skills and knowledge. Now, simulation comes in a couple different flavors. Standardized patients are probably the group we are all most familiar with. These are actors who are capable of evaluating and educating on things like history taking, physical exam, communication, and professionalism. Partial task trainers are simple anatomical models that allow the practicing of procedures like central line placement, lumbar puncture, or endotracheal intubation. Computer programs are screen-based video game type simulators that are often used for surgical training and things like fiber optic bronchoscopy. Human patient simulators are life-sized plastic mannequins capable of mimicking human physiology to varying degrees. In our own Sim Center, we have high fidelity mannequins. The range of function varies largely based off of make and model, but generally they are able to provide physical findings like heart sounds, lung sounds, chest rise and fall. They can display vital signs and those vital signs can reflect physical findings and also respond to different interventions during the simulation session. They are controlled by a team of educators from the Sim Center who sit on the other side of a one-way glass mirror, as shown in this photo. These mannequins truly allow participants the ability to suspend disbelief, creating a highly effective learning environment, safe from negative patient outcomes. But I really want to stress, it is not the mannequin that in, is making these situations feel realistic. To be an effective simulation capable of closely resembling real life scenarios and capturing the stress of managing those situations depends on a ton of preparation on the part of the educators, as well as buy-in from participants. The first part of any successful simulation curriculum is a simulation plan. Considerable time and effort needs to go into each scenario's development. What are the main goals and objectives of this session? How will you ensure the curriculum is applicable to your learners, thereby motivating them to be there? You'll need to establish some type of benchmark to determine how your learners are performing in the simulation. Frequently in simulation, well thought out checklists are often used as a standardized way to assess each of your learners. These checklists need to be planned and vetted beforehand to ensure that they're specific and measurable. At the start of every SIM session, the simulation team will need to introduce the residents to the SIM center, the mannequin, and provide an overview of the events of the day. Sometimes some sessions also have some brief introductory teaching on the topic that is about to be discussed. Simulation sessions depend on their ability to help the learners suspend disbelief. Each learner needs to have a role and feel that they are making their own decisions and that the path down that scenario is based on their own choices. In reality, and this goes back to the importance of pre-simulation work, instructors need to create these sessions anticipating where their learner is going to go and their decisions. Ideally, it's almost like the educator is invisibly leading their learner through the scenario. If the group is advancing too quickly, the educators need to be able to be flexible with their curriculum and advance the degree of difficulty. One of the things I think that's so interesting about simulation is it's not actually the session, the sim scenario that's the most important. The greatest education benefit from simulation comes during the debriefing. This time directly after skills practice allows learners the opportunity to reflect on their performance and receive structured feedback, identifying gaps in their knowledge and ways to close them. 
learners oftentimes then have the opportunity to take that feedback and incorporate it right away into another simulation case. I'm sure we've all received feedback like read more or keep doing what you're doing. Simulation literature has shown that simulation without effective debriefing by instructors offers little or no benefit to trainees. For this reason, it is so important to think intentionally about the entire simulation curriculum from the plan all the way to the debriefing. So we've shown simulation is a great asset to help our trainees learn, but it's evident that this type of curriculum is not as easy as just throwing together a PowerPoint. Are there any tools in the education literature that we can adapt and modify to simulation education to help ensure that we improve our residents' knowledge after the course? Now, to discuss this, I'm going to take a few minutes to move away from simulation to discuss components of education learning theory that have started to be incorporated into simulation teaching, namely deliberate practice and mastery-based learning. Sprague and Stewart described expertise as occurring along a continuum, a novice learner, like a medical student or an early intern. They start in the unconscious incompetence phase. They don't know what they don't know. As time and experience progress, they will first gain awareness of their lack of knowledge. This consciousness drives them to be better and learn more. By the time they reach the conscious competence phase, they'll have finally gained that knowledge, but accessing it and utilizing it are difficult. The far end of the continuum is true mastery, the unconscious competence. These individuals know the information so well. Accessing this information and utilizing it, it's automatic, almost second nature. It's hard for them to explain how to do things because the steps are almost second nature to them. For example, if someone were to ask me how I'm able to ride my bike, I have no idea how to counsel someone to get there. It's second nature for me. The steps it took for me to learn balance and coordination and defy my last name and stay upright while riding, I'm not even cognitively aware of anymore. As a residency program, our goal should be to help our residents reach the conscious competence phase by the end of their training. They will know what they do and don't know. With their self-awareness, they'll be driven to access tools for ongoing learning and opportunities for development. But this had me thinking, how accurate are our trainees at assessing what they do and don't know? In one study, graduating third years, were asked to assess their knowledge and skills at leading various ACLS scenarios. Overall, the residents felt really confident in their skills at managing a cardiac arrest. They felt their three years of clinical training plus two American Heart Association ACLS courses had prepared them well to lead these situations. Their self-assessment was then put to the test. Each resident's skills at leading an ACLS was objectively measured in a high fidelity simulation. And the results, they were surprising. Self-assessment scores did not correlate with objective skills demonstrated in the Sim Center. Despite their great confidence, residents had a wide variability in their skills managing the scenarios, no matter the number of codes they had led as a resident. Even more, they weren't always following resuscitation guidelines. So overall, resident self-assessment of competence was in direct contrast with their objective scores. They didn't know what they didn't know. Educational theory has shown that for learners to achieve and maintain mastery, they need to develop a key set of skills, practice them to fluency, and know how to apply them in relevant contexts. Repetitive practice is crucial in this formula. Now, as our former Packer coach, not quarterback, I've recently learned, said, not all practice is equal. 
it is possible for a learner to practice multiple times with no improvement in performance. And we all intuitively know this. Think back to quarantine and when you were attempting to pick up some new hobby, maybe it was playing an instrument or cross stitching or sourdough baking. For myself, my parents can tell you, I spent many hours at the piano as a kid playing my chords. But my parents will also be quick to tell you that I am no Mozart and I will definitely not be playing the piano during my grand rounds. While I put in the hours practicing, I was not intentional as I, I was not intentional at all. I sat at the piano solely to punch my hours, but did not pay any thought to what I was practicing. I just put my head down and did the work. Like me, when most people practice, they focus on the things they already know how to do. It is much more fun to practice a piano piece you're actually good at. But deliberate practice, that's different. Originated by psychologist Dr. Erickson in the 1990s, deliberate practice entails repeated rehearsal of something you don't know how to do well. So instead of me setting the timer and practicing my piano piece from start to finish, I should have broken it down into its component parts and solely focused on the hardest part of the piece. I would have practiced that part over and over again until it became almost automatic. Deliberate practice is really hard work. It requires a highly motivated learner who is guided in their practice by specific, well-defined learning objectives that help them focus where they should practice. In order to ensure that both the learner and the teacher can assess their progress on this continuum to expertise, the practice must be structured so that it's possible to be measured. The teacher will then use these measurements to provide feedback. That feedback along with the measurements will also help the learner monitor their own progress and guide further deliberate practice on practice on practice until ultimately mastery is reached and then you can advance to the next skill. You may recognize that intelligence is not listed as a prerequisite for expertise in deliberate practice. Key to success in this model is not your baseline knowledge, but you being a highly motivated learner who is able to stay engaged in this really challenging experience. What about mastery learning? The second topic I brought up. To understand mastery learning, I want you to think back to when you were learning algebra in school. To learn algebra, for example, how to solve a problem with a single variable like x, you'd go to class and be introduced to the concept from your teacher. Later, you would go home and do homework assignment after homework assignment, learning how to apply this concept. Eventually, you and the rest of your class would get an exam on single variable math. Now, no matter your score, whether it was a 70, an 80, 90, or a 95%, you and the rest of the class would advance to the next topic the following day. Now, we're all in medicine, so we're all overachievers and probably got a 90 to a 95% on the test, and that's great. But what about that 5 to 10% we didn't know? And what happens if that 5% that we missed is later critical to learn a new topic? This happens in education, including medical education all the time. As an intern in the ICU, you may struggle to understand vent management. It's complicated. By the end of your ICU rotation, you may still not be totally sure despite your best efforts. Either way, you're rotating off service and starting your primary care block next month. The next time you come back to the ICU, maybe as a second year at the VA, when your first call on answering all troubleshooting questions for why a patient is not ventilating appropriately. Why does education function this way? This is not how you learn to do most other skills. Like, think back to when you were learning to ride a bike. When you first got your bike, 
your parents did not give you one week to learn all the skills you would need to bike safely, like staying upright, turning, and stopping before they took those training wheels off. And they definitely didn't take the training wheels off when you were only able to stop 75% of the time. They waited until you had consistently demonstrated your ability to use this skill before advancing the difficulty. And your parents, they were incorporating aspects of mastery-based learning. Mastery-based learning is structured on the concept of excellence for all. In this framework, each learner is expected to reach the same final level of achievement before advancing on. This is often measured in the form of a minimum passing score that they need to reach on some objective assessment before they can move on. So for example, my math teacher may have said, I can't move on to two variable math until I'm able to at least get a 95% on the single variable test. Now mastery will require well-defined goals and learning objectives. Clear performance metrics will be necessary to determine where your learner is on that spectrum and when they've reached mastery. And to know where your learner is on that spectrum will require baseline testing to see where their knowledge is at the beginning. Central to mastery learning is the understanding that progress through this continuum and getting to that minimum passing standard will vary for individual learners. As opposed to all learners advancing at the same time as what happens in grade school, a learner is only able to advance to that next level once they have met all of the goals and objectives and that minimum standard. For some, this may mean they have to engage in multiple experiences of deliberate practice and retesting before they can advance on. Now, even though this is a Zoom meeting and all of your cameras are turned off, I can metaphorically see your head spinning. Katie, that sounds like a lot of work. Has anyone even demonstrated that this is effective? Why should a residency program devote resources to something which is no better than the current clinical apprenticeship model? Researchers at Northwestern raised that question and put it to the test. They wanted to assess the effectiveness of a simulation curriculum they created to train their internal medicine residents how to perform a lumbar puncture. For this mastery curriculum, each of their interns was required to meet or exceed a minimum passing score on a lumbar puncture skills test. Residents who did not reach that minimum score were then sent through more deliberate practice with a mannequin and then retested until that minimum standard was met. Now, to assess how this standard stacks up against clinical training, the internal medicine intern's performance on the LP skills test was compared to the performance of second through fourth year neurology residents. Now these neurology residents had not completed the simulation curriculum, but they did have one to three years of neurology clinical training. So the gauntlet was thrown. Who's gonna do better? The minimum standard on this test was set at 85% by an expert panel, and I've marked that by an orange horizontal line. In the pretest of the interns, one out of the 58 internal medicine interns exceeded the minimum score even prior to the simulation curriculum. Following the three hour simulation curriculum, 95% of the interns met that minimum standard. Only three did not, but they were all subsequently able to reach that minimum score with just an hour's worth of further practice. And overall, when you compare the mean checklist scores on this test, you find that the scores increased from 46% prior to the simulation to almost 96%. So what about our other contenders, the neurology residents? How did they do? Only two out of the 36 neurology residents met or exceeded the minimum passing score on the LP assessment. This was even though the neurology residents had a high self-confidence in their ability to perform lumbar punctures and had performed multiple LPs in the clinical setting. Surprising for the study leads was that over half of the neurology residents did not correctly identify the anatomic location to do an LP 
and could not list routine studies performed on the CSF. And when you compare post-test checklist scores between the interns and the neurology residents, you found that the intern score was 46% higher than that of traditionally trained residents. In summary, this simulation curriculum utilizing deliberate practice and mastery-based learning led to significant competence in lumbar puncture skills and was better than, traditionally train, than traditional training. So we've established that simulation-based mastery learning and deliberate practice are an effective model. But let's return to the example I posed at the beginning. Does simulation-based mastery learning with deliberate practice improve residents' confidence and skill in leading a cardiac arrest? Wayne and her colleagues created an ACLS simulation curriculum structured around the concept of deliberate practice. In their study, 38 second-year internal medicine residents were randomized to either undergo a simulation course or enter a waitlist control. After randomization, each group underwent a pre-assessment testing, assessing their baseline ACLS skills level. The intervention group then underwent an eight-hour simulation course structured over four two-hour sessions in the span of two weeks. In these sessions, the residents were exposed to six of the most common ACLS scenarios seen in the hospital. Both groups then underwent a second round of assessment of their ACLS skills in the sim lab, three months after randomization. At baseline, prior to randomization in the simulation curriculum, both groups did not significantly differ on their checklist scores of ACLS skills out of a total of 300 points. Following the simulation curriculum, a significant difference was found in total checklist scores between the two groups, with the simulation group having a score that was 38% higher than that for the control. Now, wanting to prove that the results could be replicated, the study group did something pretty slick. The control group was then crossed over into the intervention arm and received the simulation curriculum. Following this, a third round of assessments testing was completed six months after randomization. And what they found was exciting. The results were demonstrated again. After the crossover group attended the simulation curriculum, their ACLS skills improved. Overall, these results demonstrated that residents' baseline performance in ACLS scenarios improved significantly following a simulation curriculum structured on deliberate practice compared to clinical experience alone. Now, residents really liked this curriculum and were highly motivated by it. Statements such as, practice with the medical simulator boost my clinical skills, and repetitive practice with the simulator was a valuable educational experience. And my favorite, the simulator has helped prepare me to be a code leader better than the ACLS course. Residents felt strongly that this course should be a mandatory part of their training. Aware of prior research demonstrating that skills decay rapidly without practice or use, especially ACLS skills, Wayne and her colleagues again wanted to assess the amount of ACLS skill decay that would occur in their simulator trained residents. And what they found was surprising. They found that their residents' ACLS skills did not significantly decay as they had hypothesized. Rather, their skills were maintained up to 14 months after the curriculum. So, so far, we have shown that an ACLS curriculum built around deliberate practice is well received by residents. That residents felt more confident after completing their course to lead cardiac arrest that it resulted in improved ACLS skills in the sim lab. But what about the holy grail of any educational curriculum? Have they demonstrated that this curriculum improves patient care practice or outcomes? Wayne and her colleagues again looked at her simulator trained residents to assess this question. Their group looked retrospectively at all cardiac arrests at Northwestern Hospital that were led by internal medicine residents during a six month time period. They compared codes led by their simulator trained second year residents to those led by third year residents. Their third year residents had not undergone the simulation curriculum, but they did have over two years of clinical experience and had all recently renewed their ACLS provider status through an AHA course. 
Now, their study defined adherence as greater than 75% compliant with American Heart Association guidelines. Overall, their simulator trained residents were over seven times more likely to lead an adherent ACLS response compared to traditionally trained residents. And remember, this is despite the fact that the second years have less clinical training and have led fewer codes in clinical practice. Now, you might ask about post-event survival, and there was no statistical significant difference between the two groups, but there was a trend towards increased survival in the simulator-trained group alone. Likely, the inability to find statistical significance is due to the small group size and multiple confounders to the patient population. But this study, again, demonstrates that clinical training alone is not sufficient to prepare our residents to lead a cardiac arrest. Now, there's something else I want to point out. While there's no question this curriculum improved ACLS skills both in the sim lab and in clinical practice, one thing the authors noted, which you may have noted as well, even with simulation training, the second year residents only met that 75% compliance marker 68% of the time. That's good, but I don't think I would call that great. Wanting to ensure a higher excellence for all their residents, the program transitioned their curriculum to a mastery learning program, incorporating a minimum passing score. So let's compare the new mastery curriculum with, pri with deliberate practice, or the new mastery curriculum to the prior model with deliberate practice. To do this, the group again looked retrospectively at all cardiac arrests at Northwestern that were led by internal medicine residents. This time, both their second and third years had undergone the simulation curriculum and passed the minimum score. They found that their residents trained by this method had significantly higher adherence to American Heart Association guidelines. That was both comparing it to the PGY3s without simulator training and those who had undergone simulator training with deliberate practice. Mastery-based learning significantly increased the learning gains their residents achieved in ACLS skills compared to traditional training and simulation training with deliberate practice. So now that we've established that simulation-based learning is effective, let's take a look at our own residency simulation program, reviewing the types of things our residents are exposed to and assess areas for growth. Early and intern year, all of our trainees complete the UW Central Line training. Interns additionally participate in a PAP and pelvic workshop, a simulation session with standardized patients meant to help build resident confidence and skill in performing a pelvic exam. We additionally have each intern participate in an acute simulation session. This session runs the interns through two scenarios with a high fidelity mannequin assessing their approach to a patient with acute hypoxic respiratory failure and septic shock. In the spring, each intern additionally participates in an interactive point of care ultrasound experience where they learn the basics of the bedside cardiac and lung ultrasound assessment. The final simulation session is intern mock code. In our program, residents can start serving as the code leader as early as their second year. In order to prepare them for this role, each intern is placed in a four-hour simulation session where they run through the four most common ACLS scenarios. This curriculum is structured around that concept of deliberate practice we talked about. Each intern in the group has the opportunity to rotate through the different code team roles, serving as the code leader once. Following each session, a debriefing is held by a faculty member, guiding the group through structured reflection and highlighting areas for improvement. Our senior residents get one more code simulation experience in the interdisciplinary mock code as second or third year residents. This is another high fidelity ACLS simulation course integrating internal medicine residents, pharmacy residents, and nursing students to teach communication and teamwork skills. Sorry about that. Our program has a great foundation in simulation education. We have done the work and have all the resources in place to advance our residency to the next level and think of ways to better prepare our residents for that miracle on Hudson event at work. 
And while I think our intern mock code does a great job at introducing our interns to ACLS, it does not prove that each trainee is competent to lead a code at the VA or UW. I propose that we break the intern mock code into two sessions. During the first session, the residents will participate in the current intern mock code scenario. In the spring, all interns will again participate in an ACLS simulation training, except this time, the intern should be required to meet or exceed a minimum passing score on six of the most common ACLS scenarios in the hospital. Meeting this minimum score would be mandatory before putting the trainee in the position of having to carry the code pager at either of our institutions. Now, ACLS is just one of many high stakes scenarios our residents are exposed to during training. To better prepare our trainees, we need to enhance our current acute situation training. Multiple acute situation exercises should be held throughout residency, exposing residents to common high stakes scenarios they see in the hospital and those more rare but not to miss diagnoses like thyrotoxicosis. For our upper level residents, we can have more advanced sessions covering things like what to do when a patient on three pressors and when to consider ECMO. Now, there are of course barriers to implementation of a large simulation curriculum. A well thought out simulation curriculum takes time. In Wayne and her colleague studies, their simulation curriculum required 120 to 150 hours of simulation lab time. That does not include the large amount of time on the part of the educators to create, test run, implement, evaluate, and adjust their curriculum. In order to do all this extra work, the program and department need to dedicate faculty time towards education development. Each educator who leads a simulation session needs to be instructed on how to effectively debrief. Fortunately, our Sim Center has multiple faculty who have their masters in simulation education. They can offer their expertise to help ensure a well thought out curriculum is built and teach our educators on this important skill. Really, they're an underutilized resource at our institution. Now, of course, as the senior scheduling chief, I am well aware of how hard it is to pull residents from clinical rotations and bring them to the Sim Center. It's even harder to coordinate that limited time with the availability in a busy SIM lab. Another barrier is cost. Wayne and her colleagues found that the total cost of their simulation curriculum was $40,000 in the first year and $20,000 in subsequent year. This included time to be in the SIM center for the mannequins and also faculty time. Another huge benefit of our simulation pro center is that simulation time and resources are paid for by a joint venture between UW Health and SMPH. The only cost our program would have to cover would be of disposable items or standardized patients if we used them. And again, faculty time and FTE dedicated to curriculum development are necessary to ensure a well thought out education session. While these are barriers, as medical educators, we need to figure out how to overcome them. As the Institute of Medicine reported in 2000 in to, is to err as human, medical errors are incredibly common in this country with the number of deaths equivalent to a jumbo jet crashing every day. The aviation industry throws a ton of money and time into preventing 747s from crashing on a regular basis. And medicine needs to do this as well. And simulation is a valuable tool to help with this problem. This is not something we can do without. And the downstream investments of implementation of a simulation curriculum are likely vast. As I prepare to leave this institution, I've been reflecting a lot on my time as you chief and also my time as a trainee here. Greater simulation development must occur. We need to see this as an opportunity to take our training to the next level and ensure that our residents are able to provide appropriate patient care and also ensure that we are appropriately teaching them and helping them develop towards the expertise that we expect.
So in summary, trainee self-assessed confidence in approaching different skills, whether it's a lumbar puncture or leading a cardiac arrest, does not correlate with competence in those skills. The only way to truly assess whether our residents have achieved mastery in a certain area is to objectively assess their skills. Not all practice is perfect. To become an expert in any area requires a high level of motivation and a learner who engages in regular practice structured around feedback and frequent assessment of their skill acquisition. Our current structure of clinical training is not built to facilitate learning and is not adequately preparing our residents. Simulation is an optimal learning tool to help our trainees develop mastery in a safe environment. While time and cost are barriers to its development, we as medical educators must look for ways to overcome these in order to better prepare our residents and provide optimal patient care. So maybe now after this talk, instead of saying see one, do one, teach one, maybe now you'll say see one, sim one, do one. I'd like to thank the many individuals who helped prepare my talk today. I would particularly like to send a huge amount of gratitude to the entire Sim Center, especially Gina, Mark, and Eric for their assistance with this talk. They have been incredibly supportive of our entire residency program and myself in the implementation of my ultrasound curriculum and then all of the different workshops that we have for our residents throughout training in my chief year. Their patients, expertise, and knowledge is so beneficial to our program and has really helped our residents develop as educators. And finally, on our last official weekday as chiefs, before we start handing over the responsibilities to the rising chiefs, I need to say a huge thank you to my co-chiefs, Dr. Sarah Donahue, Dr. Lauren Banizak, and Dr. Victoria Gillet. You've heard this all before, but we definitely did not anticipate a global pandemic when we signed up to be chiefs in our second year of residency. I have truly enjoyed getting to work alongside such smart and inspiring colleagues. I'm gonna miss you guys so much, but this has been a lovely year and I'm happy to take any questions that anybody may have. Great, well, thank you so much, Katie. And this is the uh, last of the chief resident grand rounds. And I, I will just say, I have been so impressed by all four uh, lectures, uh, Katie's, Dr. Fell, Dr. Banasek, Dr. Donahue, Dr. Gillet. I mean, uh, such professional, um, amazing presentation. So kudos to all of you. Thank uh, you. And, um, awesome job for this past year uh, in general. Um, there are a couple of questions. I will start. Um, is there, a, so one question from Dan Rosenberg, when I was training at UW, most residents did not run an actual code until their third year. Is there a role for refresher simulation training in the second, third year? Yeah, that's a great question. And I agree with Danny. I think there. I think this is a skill that we have seen that should be practiced over and over again, and that you have the opportunity to come back in the Sim Center and receive feedback on way to improve. So I think in the second and third year, there could be opportunities for advanced code training. So maybe exposure to more complex situations and also opportunities to do more interdisciplinary involvement, bringing down some of our nursing colleagues on the RN code team and the pharmacists to really replicate a true code scenario. So I completely agree. There's definitely opportunities to keep those skills fresh by repeated exposure. Um, so another question sort of along the same line. So since uh, generally we wait till the second, third year to run codes, what a, is there an opportunity to increase responsibility for interns for running the codes in their first year when you know they have uh, are fresher in the simulation training um, and it may be an opportunity to increase the stickiness of the training. I think there could be a really good opportunity, not for them to serve as the code leader, but to almost be like a buddy to the senior. 
what I was showing before is definitely one of the parts of a code leader, knowing ACLS is just one component, but having confidence, I think, in yourself and your clinical skills and those communication, that I think you see a lot more as, you, as you're a second or a third year and you have a little bit more clinical experience under your belt. But there have been studies that I didn't show here that once you institute a simulation program into a residency, it kind of like roots itself into all people, even those who haven't completed the simulation training. And so I think there's an opportunity to, yeah, have an intern alongside the senior as a buddy and watch them see how the senior models the behavior and learn some things along the side, be involved in the debriefing to then be a little bit better prepared when they're a second year and they have that role and they're carrying the pager sitting at the head of the bed for sure. Great. Um, so my question is, you know, we've been talking about simulation, about going to the sim center and, uh, you know, doing the mock code. Uh, what is out there in terms of more virtual reality training for these type of scenarios? And is that an opportunity for us to um, not uh, be as tied into some of the physical space and timing limitations? I haven't seen, I, in my research myself, I didn't see as much about ACLS virtual reality simulation, but they're virtual reality is definitely booming um, in simulation world and our own sim center is starting to incorporate some of those practices. There has been shown that in regards to certain things like assessment of ICU critical care knowledge for things like vent management or hemodynamic support that you don't always necessarily need to be in the sim center and get that sim time that education can be done at the bedside it's just taking what we see in the sim center the scenario that debriefing afterwards and having someone watch what you're doing it can all still be done at the bedside you just take those skills and put them there so that's one way to avoid some of the sim time um, uh, there's another question really about um, dissemination of knowledge. So we have a lot of the guidelines, et cetera, on our websites. Um, do we know how well that information is then dis is disseminated to our residents? Um, this is actually a big problem in general of kind of implementation science. Are you referring to like the guide, like the AHA guidelines or guidelines on how to run a code? Um, uh, through some of our, uh, the CCKM, the, the I, what, clinical knowledge, I forget what the whole acronym is. Um, uh, so the question is, uh, just knowledge dissemination can occasionally be a problem. Do we know how familiar our residents um, are with internal medicine clinical guidelines that are currently available on our UConnect website? I think that's where you run into the problem of residents are really busy and they're balancing a lot of things. And so it's, you know, and they get tons of emails and clinical practice. And so I think part of the problem is the residents might not be familiar that those guidelines are available on UConnect. And then I think that's where simulation training or even just training in general could be helpful is in those debriefing sessions, we can put those guidelines could be pulled up. So the residents would be shown where they could find it and that they are available. They might just not know they're there because they're busy being residents, a key part of training and its problems. Um, Shobi Cheda has a, a excellent question about the spacing between your refresher courses. Uh, how much do we know about the timing? Does that vary per person? Is there an optimal uh, time for refresher? Does it spread out? The more sessions you've done, can you space out the timing? I think it depends, you know, in the literature, what I was looking at, it depends on how you're structuring the curriculum. So for example, the mastery based curriculum where you were required to reach that minimum passing score, which meant some people had to do multiple retesting that ended up leading to knowledge retention almost 14 months out. So you could say if some type of minimum, like mastery based where you're required to reach a minimum score, you could do at least once a year re-exposure. More simulation sessions structured around deliberate practice. I have seen that it can be maintained for six months, but when you start looking out at a year, you do see that that skill has started to drop off. 
So I definitely think that once a year, there should be re-exposure to this topic to ensure that it's maintained. And then of course, you have what you need to do is, and the benefit of simulation education is that you can assess your learners. And if you find that your learners are not maintaining this information, you can shorten the amount of time that you have. Or if you're finding they understand it really well, you can try to space it out. I'm but no, I haven't found there's an exact time because it largely depends on each individual skill that you're assessing, how much exposure your residents have to it and the type of curriculum. So I'm going to try to combine two questions for the sake of uh, uh, time. And so, you know, a lot of the, the data is on very discrete skills um, or tasks like LPs or codes. Um, what about more broad uh, applications, whether just general history taking, physical exam taking, et cetera? And then along the same lines, if there is evidence for that, should we think about totally blowing up our model of residency training from an apprentice-based model to um, one that is uh, much more simulation focused? Yeah, that's a really good question. It is true that simulation, especially mastery based learning lends itself really well to things that are skills or algorithmic based like ACLS. It's easy to create a checklist and then mark off what yes or no the resident is able to achieve that skill. But there have been other studies that have shown that you can take this type of curriculum and apply it to something that's more complex to measure. The best example that I have was I was looking again at critical care teaching where they exposed in one study their interns to a critical care teaching where they taught them things like vent management and basics to hemodynamic support in an intern boot camp course. And then they retested the interns at the end of their MICU month and compared the intern score assessment on a bedside skill to their third year residents who had just completed the MICU. And the intern scored significantly higher than the third year graduating residents. So there is opportunities to even do this type of curriculum for more complex skills like history taking or physical exam. It just requires more effort on the part of when you're building your checklist and needing expert involvement on what your goals and objectives are. And for your last question, I think it's really important to point out that simulation is in no way, shape or form meant to replace traditional clinical training. There is a huge benefit to clinical training and you learn a lot at the bedside. Simulation is more supposed to be an additional thing to it, to enhance it, not to replace it in any shape or form. There are only some things that really are best taught at the bedside. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for a really wonderful overview of the benefits and um, uh, opportunities we have in simulation training. And again, thank you, Dr. Fell. And again, all of the chief residents, it is their last official day. Um, and uh, I hope all of you in the audience will are, give them a virtual um, round of applause. Uh, and for all of them, I am looking forward to following all of their careers and seeing um, their continued success. Uh, so thank you again, amazing grand rounds. Uh, and uh, we look forward to lots more um, coming from all of you. Thank you so much. All right, take care everyone. <laughs>